Today's project is a measuring device with a laser, again, but it is different this time. The motivation is the same as before though. We want to accurately measure a space in three dimensions so that we could do some remodeling work in that space, but off-site. The backup motivation for this also is that I think perhaps I just like working on measuring equipment, so if I have to fall back to that, then th that's fine too. There are a lot of 3D measurement strategies out there, but it seems like a lot of them, you, you end up with the pick two of three situation, which you see elsewhere as well, right? So there's quality, cost, and schedule is the classic one. So if you see you want high quality and you want low cost, so good in these two categories, then your schedule is gonna suffer. So with this one, I think that the three things are kind of like accuracy, cost, and skill. So if you want high accuracy and low cost, you can get that with, you know, you can have 3D measurements that are very accurate, but it's gonna take a tremendous amount of skill and probably a very long time as well. So what I'm trying to do here is to get pretty good accuracy with reasonable cost and reasonable skill. So high, medium, medium. And I think that should be possible. You're probably wondering also about the cable tool that I built, which looks like this. So the issue with this that I arrived at was not that the numbers I quoted in the test I did were wrong, because it did work, but I think this is not especially robust for trans, uh, transporting and bouncing around and things like that. It does require some user skill. Uh, I think the main thing was that the accuracy I was able to achieve with this was with, you know, sort of good, good, good on a whole bunch of different criteria, and that doesn't leave you a lot of breathing room. What you really want is you want a tool where you're going, wow, this thing works really well. I don't need all of that, and then we can discount it back when it gets bounced around or it's dirty or a variety of other things go wrong. And in this one, you're exerting in different directions and with varying amounts as well. So those are some complicating factors that I think put a, put a floor on, on the accuracy uh, that you could achieve with a, with a device like this. If you look at grinding and milling and machining, that's kind of a similar concept. Grinding is much more accurate and part of the reason why is because you're fundamentally exerting less force. So we talked about a couple things that didn't work. What is the strategy that we're gonna use? If we think about a camera right here, which is looking forward, and we have a laser pointer, if we put this parallel to the camera, when something moves closer or further away, if you don't wiggle it back and forth, the dot stays in the same place. But if we were to angle this dot like so, then as it comes closer, to the camera's appearance, that dot would move, move over and it's proportional to the depth. So instead of having a dot, if you have a line, then you can measure the features on a whole surface. In the interest of not completely reinventing the wheel, I acquired via eBay this Gocator unit. This is the 2370. So basically the laser line is projected out from here and there's a camera here which is at an angle so line comes out, camera points this way. It's basically the same thing I just described, but instead of the line being angled, the line is straight and the camera is angled. And then the rest of this contraption, which I have it mounted to, is my own doing. I'll take responsibility for that, and we will talk about it more later. But basically this is the unit. It then has a cable. There's also an IO cable that can come out. This one goes around, has power and then ethernet, which goes into the laptop. The laser is engaged, and we can see here the profile of the garage door over there. And if I take something and put it in here, you'll see that profile. I can go back, forward. I can turn it. The frame rate that you're seeing here is much less than what it can scan at. It can do full resolution, full everything at 300 and some change hertz. If you constrict the field of view that it's measuring and the depth and some other things, then you can crank that up as high as 5,000 hertz, I believe. For this particular unit, they have a whole range of them. There is a dead zone as well. So there's 400 millimeters here where, well, I'm blocking the laser, but if I if I just block the laser, it's showing no measurement because it cannot measure for the first 400 millimeters. And then there's 500 millimeters 
of range. The nice thing about a used unit like this is that it does not come with a warranty, so you can go ahead and take it apart. I have a few photos from when I disassembled it before. So this is the housing when you've lifted the top part out. They have a logic board under here. They have some stuff that goes out to the circuitry. Wasn't much going on on the other side aside from that ribbon cable. Here's the top part when you lift that out. It's a little bit easier to see what's going on here since there's light coming from the back side instead of it being dark. This side view also gives you a sense of how beefy this thing is. Here it is without the housing on top. It's also worth noting that this thing is mounted almost kinematically, I would say, into this housing here. There's very few contact points, which which makes sense because you want it to be stable, but it's a pretty pretty hefty thing. Some filters on the camera unit, and then the laser line itself. The spread on this laser line is about 46 degrees. Now that we know how this thing works, how do we increase this range to make it more usable? As I mentioned before, 400 millimeters dead zone plus 500 active. 900 millimeters is respectable, but not especially useful for even a small size room. We need to crank that up. So I was thinking about ideas on how to pull this off. And the most obvious one was to lengthen this base distance here so that your camera is looking at a, a larger range proportionally. And I was actually thinking about sawing the thing in half. And that's why I took it apart was to see if there was like a big circuit board in there that was gonna make that a problem. And in the process of looking at some of their drawings, I noticed that they have another version. So I have the 2370 and they make a 2375. And I noticed that that base distance was the same, but the angle of the camera was different but only by a few degrees. So I thought that was pretty interesting. You can work out the math, it, it made sense. So it's about 650 millimeters dead zone and then 1350 active. Well, that's pretty cool. I didn't buy this one because I haven't seen any on eBay yet at all. And I definitely haven't seen other ones even for reasonable prices. So this one I got for a pretty good price and it was somewhat close to the right range. They do have ones with smaller base distances. So basically, I could increase this, that requires sawing it in half, but then that throws out all your alignment and other things. So that really wasn't feeling super appealing. And then I thought about, hey, what if I was to tilt this line over, right? So what, what would that do for me? And this is what we had before there. So the 2370 at a 500 millimeter range. But if you modify this and you tilt this line six degrees over, then you have a larger dead zone, that's true, but you have a much, much larger active zone. Now you do lose some resolution as this angle gets closer and closer to this angle, meaning they get, you know, they become smaller and smaller here. You have less resolution further out than you do down here because your pixels are pointing out evenly spaced radially, which means that a small distance here gives you a small distance there but a small angular change here gives you a much larger distance on there. So there is sort of a limit to this, right? If you tilt it over too far, you're gonna get pretty awful resolution out towards the end. You don't wanna go crazy, but I did the math on this. And if you look at, so a zero degree change is where we started off, 400, 500. 10 degrees about the maximum that's usable. You'd have theoretically three and a half meters of range here, but your resolution, like I said, towards the end gets pretty awful. So I actually selected six and eight as the ones that I was gonna target. So the question now is how do you change that angle? I mean, one option would be to actually take and change that laser line internally, but then I have to screw with it and it'll lose the alignment and it's hard to make it go back. So I need to think about some ideas to do that. Yes, you could also change the camera angle, but the reason why I'm focusing on the laser line here is that the camera has to go through the glass and Changing that angle by a small amount seems like it would be more difficult. You're, you're just goofing with a more sensitive device than you are when, when you change this line. I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but the default Z resolution for the 2370 was 55 microns. This is up close, I believe. They call this out a little more detailed when in the actual data sheet for this specific model. This resolution is quite good, much better than I need, so I can afford to, to lose some of this when I do this angle modification. So the question is, how do we bend this beam so that it's going this way? First thing I thought about was lenses, but that seemed like it might be a little bit steeper of a hill to climb than I was 
prepared to do at the moment. And I don't want any distortions, right? I want exactly what's coming out here, but turned slightly. So I was thinking then about mirrors and I went to my good friend, the internet and acquired some high quality mirrors. This one actually still has the protective surface on it. This one I think is a quarter wavelength one. So that one was a couple dollars. It's got a nice backing on it. These are all first surface mirrors. I don't want any funky, you know, dual things showing up, but they're pretty good. This one's a little bit dirty, so I'll have to clean that off, but nice big mirror also with a bit of thickness. This one doesn't have a flatness spec, but it's, it's pretty flat. You get the dual lines if I have the laser shining partly through the thickness of the glass, so you got to get it in the right spot. And you can do things at an angle also, so you have to get that alignment correct. Fundamentally though, it's pretty simple. You can see that we have no value showing up there because it can't see it. I'm going to start bouncing it over sideways and as it comes into view, you can see the reading that we're getting. Not getting a great return. It doesn't have enough signal perhaps. So I cranked up the exposure. This is now 2000 microseconds instead of 350. So it's about 6x the power that's coming out. Let's see if we get a better return once I bend this line over. Yeah, check that out. You can see it has the features of the garage door on there, and this is at a much, much greater range. While I do feel pretty good about the mirror, and I was glad to see how well it worked, the mechanics of mounting this on here and getting it fixed, even with a much smaller mirror, just the mechanics of mounting it on here and it getting bumped and all of that is definitely not ideal. I spent some time, did a bit of the leg work, climbed up the hill on lenses, and I bought a sample set, if it'll focus, uh, of some different lens shapes because the prism, I was originally leaning away from prisms because it spreads out the colors, right? But the thing with this is that this is a laser. They're either one wavelength, they're pretty close, right? I mean, you're, that's what you're trying to go for. So it actually shouldn't spread out that much. And they have wedge prisms. This is just a generic 60 degree one, but you can buy them in a variety of angles. We have our wedge here. Take some experimenting to get things right, but there we go. You can see that profile. I mean, I think the results are really indistinguishable from the mirror and the width of that laser line looks quite good as well. It's not a lot wider, so I'm still getting a pretty, pretty clean return as evidenced by the results. As a result of those experiments, I acquired these, or, well, there's two of them here, but six and eight degree wedge prisms. So the idea here is that this is much lower profile and we can just mount it to the front of that lens. And the six and eight degree is the deflection of the certain, certain wavelengths. They have a curve that shows this. The actual angle of the glass here is more like 14 degrees, I believe. So that'll be the next video. We'll mount this on there, see how it works. And we also have to do some math corrections because since we're pointing our beam to the side, a difference in depth now also means a difference in our horizontal or our X dimension. So there's a couple corrections there and then there's the rest of the contraption that I have it mounted to and how we put it together and make meshes and surfaces and all of that fun stuff.